I want to say first that um, an information designer, some of you might not know what that exactly is, but my undergrad is in graphic design, and so maybe many of you know what graphic design is. And um, I spent time in the corporate field, and then I decided to specialize in information design. So it's really an advocacy role that I've, I've decided you could do different sectors, but I specialize in advocating for the public, getting effective communication that's understandable, that's clear, and that's, I see myself as a translator of that. So I just want to set that in context. So I'm also going to approach this talk from the perspective of a designer. One thing we always ask ourselves is, who's the target audience, right? Who's the audience? That's a marketing sort of vocabulary. But I'm sure we all ask ourselves, who are we speaking to? It's our public. Um, a lot of the publications I've read from FEMA, um, from um, the United Nations, they refer to the general public. But who is that exactly? So I know we all think about this. We all know that there's different walks of life. People are doing different things. They have different responsibilities. But what I want to encourage is something called persona. So if you're thinking about messaging and you're thinking about communication, there, there's a way that you can invite your public into the same room as you while you're creating these messages. Um, I did this for the city of Santa Barbara for the first time when I was doing a pilot city. Um, I asked a whole bunch of questions, sent out surveys, and tried to really understand the community as a whole city. Because if you just say everyone, it becomes too general. It's not specific enough. These are composites, so these are actually not real people, uh, but they're composites that represent a whole group of people. And um, you'll see a student, a grad student, a retiree um, with mobility restrictions. Um, you'll see different social economics. You'll see the sort of kind of encompassing the pattern, the textile, the fabric of the community we're serving. So once we make these, and I have eight of them, so there's a lot more, I invite them into the room with me. So I never forget, and we name them, Joe. What about Joe? What about Carol? So we don't forget who the final reader is and what the um, intention of our message and who it's for. How can they use this? Oh, now we have to think about all these people, right, representing thousands of people, that they're all doing different things. They all have different responsibilities and backgrounds and knowledge. Uh, it's diverse, right? And we, as a design problem, as a communication problem, that is a very tall mountain. And this is why I get so into this. I just think it's such a big challenge and how can we sort of understand it well enough and then apply some of that to make effective communication. It's 11 a.m. somewhere, it's 12 a.m. somewhere, it's 3 p.m. People are doing different things. They're just doing their thing. They're not thinking about emergencies. They might have thrown a bottle of water in the trunk, but it's 11 a.m., they see fire and they're thinking, confronted by, what do we do now? Do we evacuate? What is my neighbor doing? All of these personas now are coming together as a community and making decisions. And depending on where their frame of mind is, right, I call it emergency confrontation. It is a conf it's confronting them, right, removing them from their everyday shopping, picking up their kids, going to work, and now being confronted immediately with this decision making. I do want to refer to Amanda Ripley. She simplified the process of how we make decisions um, through uh, this denial phase. I'm really good at that. <laughs> we stay in denial phase, we deliberate, and then we decide. And when we decide, it could be the right um, decision or the wrong decision, but we decide nevertheless. And I like this model because some people stay in denial for a long period of time. Right? and then they can quickly deliberate and make decisions. Some people can go through those three steps really quickly, and this is one individual. This is one, so we all, another fabric that we have to think about is everybody in the city doing the same thing at different pacing. My specific research in grad school really had to understand the cognition Cognitive psychology, I studied uh, psychology of emergency, psychology of disaster. You know, how do everyday people kind of confront information at the time of crisis? So there's these triggers and this cognitive phenomenons. So one is understanding, well, not understanding, meeting. When you meet your unconscious personality, you don't know who that person is, right? And it might be a person who just freezes. 
It might be a person who just kicks into action, right, and just knows what to do, but we don't know who that is until we're confronted by that emergency. So that Gustav, it's a, it's a theory from psychology, it's called the unconscious personality. Navy SEALs tries to push their soldiers so far to try to get to that unconscious personality so they know and they can trust that those Navy SEALs will respond at the most crisis situation in the correct way. And if they don't make that, if they don't make the standard for a good unconscious personality, they don't make the SEALs. That's how important that is. The other one, and I know you all know very well, is crowd psychology. This happens so much during evacuation, right? The neighbor's like, I'm not evacuating. Oh, okay, okay, I'm not either. And then the other neighbor's like, yeah, okay, I'm not either, right? We tend to respond together in groups because it's safe, whether it's right or wrong, right? We respond in groups, and we have this group thing happening, and we have to try to work with that, because that's something that's a phenomenon that we really can't control. Uh, tunnel vision is just really poor decision making, so it's really looking through a tunnel. Can't look at the peripheral, right? We just see one way out. It might not be the right way, it might not be the right decision, but we beeline it no matter what. Um, and the last one is temporary cognitive paralysis, which this is a fancy word at freezing. It's when we pause, right? It could be very quiet, it's silent, and we don't react the same way. And it does not discriminate against income, Education, race, it does not discriminate. None of these cognitive triggers do. The only thing that changes it is experience. So if you've had experience in emergency before, then you've, you've been confronted, and you bring that into the next experience. So what I have seen when I'm working with these emergency managers and the campaign for San Diego County, LA County, Orange County, and San Francisco, is uh, we looking at our cur the current model now is most people, the everyday public, don't learn about what to do until the time has happened, until they're impacted, right? So not only are they confronted, if you could think about all those cognitive triggers, but now they have to learn new information, right? They have to develop this mental map of what to do, and then they have to decide, do I get my kid, do I not get my, what, you know, what's their evacuation information? It is a lot of stuff happening at the same time and it's information overload, and it just makes the vulnerable triggers of those cogn cognitive phenomenons much more susceptible. Few people, so first responders, anyone who's been in an evacuation before, maybe has you know, some kind of uh, leadership role in their organization, they'll bring that training into the time of impact, so they'll be a little bit better off, just as I mentioned before, because they've had that previous experience. So when I first came, I said, you know, really? It's not the information at the time of evacuation that I want to focus on, it's the preparedness information. And more so, I know we, there's a lot of energy putting in the preparedness part. When people are at leisure, when they're not confronted, and they, can, they have better ways of learning, they can take in the information a lot better. If we can get that going, then by the time of the impact, by the time of the inf uh, crisis, they'll be able to have a stronger cognitive framework to work from. Even if it's just one more thing or two more things, it was something more than they had before. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, Tsunami Clear. So this is e the tsunami evacuation campaign that I've worked with on those counties in Southern California and now Northern California. And it's really now going back to design. So I spent four years not designing, which is really hard if you're creative. Like I'm like, I just want to design. Um, so now that I understood what the whole context is, uh, I now started to develop a visual standard. And this might sound very close to branding. And I know you guys know what branding is, right? It's the marketing brands who do a really good job. If I say Starbucks, boop, you just <laughs> all imaged you know, their, their seal. It's that repetition, it's that consistency. And I will add to this, it's the visual consistency as well. Um, with this study, before I show you the outcomes, we did a, a four-year cognitive recall study on how people remember the best formats of kind of information. So we had audio written, and the visual. In this case, it's the uh, tsunami map. So the audio, we would give evacuation information to a participant just through the audio, just through headphones, and um, they would listen to it, and then after two minutes, we'd ask them a set of questions. Same thing with the written, right? They would read it, and then same thing with the map. We'd give two minutes, because that is a study with direct mail pieces of how much people look at something before they decide to throw it away, keep it, whatever they want. What's interesting, so we had four, like 300, 350 um, uh, 
participants. This included three different communities and a cohort group on campus at Chapman University to control this, the data. Audio performed the worst at the immediate recall and the 24-hour later recall. So this tells us that even when listening to evacuation information, people had a hard time hanging on to that content, and even more so at the 24 hours later. The written was the best performing at immediate re recall, so that does include text messages, right? When you get a text, uh, we're, we're reading. So it did perform the best at immediate, uh, it's second best at recall. Um, I want to caveat this because written is a visual activity. And then visual, so the tsunami clear map, you had to process it more at the immediate, so it took longer to process the information. But it did the best at the 24 hours, so somehow visual imprints on the cognition and stays there longer. And it's not just this study, because I come across a lot of studies that say the same thing. If I could, if I could frame the tsunami clear um, information, it is the preparedness. So this is for learning, this campaign I'm about to show you, and then by the time of the evacuation, they might remember some part of it uh, that there might be a freeway closed that I used all the time. I'll remember that it might be closed, so it will make me decide a little bit differently. So first thing I did is I looked across the United States and I looked up evacuation information, evacuation instructions, and through emergency management across the United States. And I got maps. Maps. I didn't say maps. Right? I said evacuation information, evacuation instructions, and I got maps. I was like, oh, this is exciting. Why maps? That's my job. Like, why? Is that, that must be the best device. It's very visual. Uh, it takes a certain skill set to read maps. And it's also, the, when, when I studied this, it's also very eclectic. They were all different. They were all made different. Some of them were science maps. Uh, some of them were GIS. Uh, then we have some in between. I then studied the, what we call uh, visual variables. So that's just a fancy way of saying fonts, line weights, the way they cross over, we call it graphic density, color coding. So I looked at all of those things. And uh, what I found was, during the cognitive recall study, the busier, the least remembered. This is the one from Santa Barbara that the EM put on the back of the brochure for, emergency, uh, for tsunami preparedness. It was really small, it was like a business card size. So first thing I did with that, and that's the one that failed at 100% during that cognitive recall study, it was a four year, we took it out like in the first three months because we had enough data to say that wasn't uh, usable. Chopped off the foothills because this is about tsunami. And then I started to develop a code, a visual standard. There's a rule for each one of these colors. There's a rule for each one of these lines. The thickness is a rule. Everything is like visual grammar. And our first prototype is for Santa Barbara and I also included arrows. Because arrows is the instruction, isn't it? Like, without arrows, it's reference. It becomes like, this is a reference point. Do you know where you are? Arrows actually tells the reader, I want you to do something. You know, I want you to move. So we did some walking maps around um, Santa Barbara, so it's a high tourist area. What I like about this is for people who are not from the city, uh, they might be walking around the pier, and then they see this, and they say, oh my gosh, the f parking because remember, cognition, first response as a human being, we get the tsunami warning, go get the car, let's go to the car. That's our, tr that's our natural right, habit. But if they see this, they might understand, actually, going to the parking lot is a lot further, and it's more in the inundation zone, than if I walk two, five minutes out straight from the pier, then I'm in the safe zone. So again, just right immediately might change their decision making. So this gets picked up, and so for my first count, it was all San Diego. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly, because it really, the strength of this campaign is not the individual maps themselves, but how they work as a brand, right? And, that, and um, this is San Francisco, it hasn't launched yet, but this is uh, on its way to being finalized. But even with big cities, small cities, that these visual standards are able to be flexible and adaptable. I have different politics with different EMs, right? We want to include shelters, we want to include schools, we don't. And even with that flexibility, you could still see consistency and repetition, and it will still work. So someone from San Diego could travel all the way down to uh, San Francisco and not have to relearn a whole new mapping system. Uh, so we go from this to this. Another thing I've argued for when I first did this work is print. And I got a lot of pushback at first because that means funding. So I understood that context. That means I have to print, I have to ship. It's a lot of taking away from someone else's budget. 
The reason why I argue for print is because it is another confrontation word. It's called information confrontation. Anything on the app, anything on the web, people have to get up and volunteer their time. They have to go to the information, right? Print, so these were mailed out to all of the uh, San Diego residents living in the inundation zone. It lands in there, the information comes to them. They have to decide what they do with it. Some people might chuck it, fine, right? But you decided that. It came to you and you decided to chuck it. Um, some people might look at it for two minutes and some people might save it. Or they might look at it two minutes, recycle, and you know, move on. So the print part was about um, advocating for the public, get the information in, literally in their hands. And then the app and the web plays a supplement role to that. Um, I don't talk, I don't show slides about this, but I do, I'm an inclusive designer as well. I deal with visual impairment, uh, hear, hearing impairment, not so much with the printed work, but I try to consider at least some, like type size, can't go smaller than a certain degree, right? Um, color blindness. So there's some attributes of this that I try to um, incorporate, but also to say that um, apps and web is more inclusive than print. So I'm contradicting myself here because information confrontation does have a compromise. It doesn't include everybody, right? For some people, it's easier if they could zoom in, right, with the technology that we have. But I'm arguing for marriage of the both. Okay, this one makes me nervous. This is so, this is going well. Tsunami Clear is going well. And I had two EMs um, from Aliso Viejo and Laguna Beach say, you know what? We've got a fire problem in California. And I'm like, I know, but I'm so scared of it. I never wanted to confront it on my own. I, I mean, that's way more repetitive. It's like we have fire season. And they said, what would happen if we took the visual grammar from Tsunami Clearer and applied it to fire? So this campaign, uh, the first one, we, you know, looking at the kind of eclectic ways that information is given to the public when there's a fire, you know, it's updated so one's Google and some of the other stuff is media. We used the same exact visual variables, but we just changed color because it's fire, so we don't want that to get confused with tsunami. The emergency manager for Aliso, she said, you know what, this is not about real time because fires are so organic, they're so volatile, they change on the fly. This is about people developing a cognitive map of their space and understanding the risk of where they're living. So she, this is for Laguna, a lot of Laguna um, routes don't have two ways out. For Aliso, it was know your two ways out. There's two ways out. So it might not be that habit of you doing drop off or going to work or going to school. That, did you know that you can go that, this other, there's another um, exit route. There's another place that you might not have thought about if you made two turns. And so that was the idea behind Fire Clear is giving people a better understanding of where the risk, the high risk areas were, where they were in that, um, and understanding do I have an option if we were asked to evacuate, whether I was at work or at school um, or at home. This is the Laguna Beach. A lot of orange there. <laughs> and um, we took no two ways out to just know your way out because there's not a lot of um, op options here. And so, again, mailed it out. So they mailed it out to all the people, the residents uh, living in the high uh, fire risk areas. So they have gotten this. We got good feedback from the public. We haven't sent out Laguna Beach. A little nervous about that one. We'll see how the residents uh, take that in because it's really a visualization of the high risk and they might be in it, right? And they, they didn't really know um, until they see this. Um, so in a nutshell is I'm coming at this as a visual communicator, but not just a communicator, but an effective one. And that study the reason why fire clear makes me so nervous is because we didn't run the same study. I believe in running measurements every time something changes. I do not assume that this will work in Texas on the coast or New East Coast. I don't assume that because the, all the people, the communities are all different, right? So um, advocating for a methodology of somewhere in EM that we can incorporate a participatory design, that's what's called inviting our communities in and seeing what works best and how they would like the information delivered to them. All right, thank you. I mean, I try to lead with what the people are saying or what the, the specific community is saying. The one thing that's really interesting about the color and tsunami is the blue, I wanted to change the blue roots. I wanted to change blue because the signifier for blue is water. 
right? We're, we're, it's a convention, this is getting into like semiotics, but it's a convention that blue equals water, red equals danger, you know, yellow might equal sun. So we all sort of agreed on that as, a, as the symbology. So I wanted to change blue because I thought, well, what if people mistaken blue for water flow? And the research that I found was the Department of, of Transportation uh, has used blue since you know, the 60s to, in, to dictate tsunami route, tsunami evacuation route. And so that, again, is me being humbled enough to say, you know what, we as Californians at least, because I, I haven't done a study in New York or anywhere else, we've already seen tsunami route signs over and over again in that blue. I can't expect to change that just, beca you know, just because um, I think the blue equals water, and the red equals the emergency. So it really is about this compromise of what takes more precedence as far as the meaning that's already been agreed on. It's a tricky business though, because, and that's what I mean, like what happens if it goes to the East Coast, and I don't know what their roots are like, you know, I, I, it's really important to get context of everything, not just, you know, the community members and the people who live there, but also the, you know, the politics and what, what has been established already from past campaigns. So I try not to, I say standards, and it, it's kind of a scary word, but it's micro standards, can I say, like, so California, I could keep that, I feel confident that the data supports that. And that's why I got a little nervous about fire because I, you know, we did not do the testing. So for me, and this is just based on principle, I like to test everything. I like evidence-based design, and this is what that is. It's based by quantitative evidence. When I went to Santa Barbara and I met uh, the EM there, I'm like, who's your graphic designer? Tell me who that is. And she's like, um, so uh, talk about hum humility. I was like, you're it. So I, I, right away, I got the context of ENMs. I have to do everything. And the skills might not be, you know, you're just sort of like trying to pull things together. So I started this, um, so two things to that. I tried for a grant, a NOAA grant and a digital humanities grant to try to get software engineered, an open sourced software to get engineered to make a platform where, and this is me not being a coder or a computer scientist, where they could just punch in and then this map would just come out. <laughs> That's my dream, that everybody would just not have to be, because these are all in Illustrator, so I don't know if anyone knows about Adobe software, but I'm hand drawing these. These are not GIS. And I work with Kevin and Rick at the Geological Survey and um, Cal OES. I fudge inundation lines. I'm like, do you want them to evacuate or you don't? Because GIS might hit it right on the corner of that street. And like, we want them to evacuate. So I will fudge that line above the street to de tell people you know, that they can evacuate. So it's, I understand it's so craft-based, and I don't want that. I want it to be template-based. And I'm, I, a NOAA's grant said it wasn't scientific enough, and Digital Humanities says it's not um, humanities enough, and I'm rocking this really in-between line. So I won't stop fighting for that, because that is what I want. Um, I get on a high horse about that. I'm not, I can't remember my second point to that, but yes. Oh, I did, uh, we did start this design network for emergency management. So this is where we have five different board members from different continents. So one from Taiwan, New Zealand, I represent United States, we're working on that, um, and uh, Amsterdam. And we're the board, and they're having the same exact conversations, the same challenges, and we now have members that are mostly all EMs, um, that are coming together, so we were able to throw our first design workshop for EMs at Chapman University this past January. If you go to the Facebook, does it go backwards? No. Uh, there's a Facebook design network for emergency manager. Uh, you'll see uh, photos of that, and it was emergency managers all doing icon design. Like, we gave them basic training and design fundamentals. Visual fundamental, you know, even um, all those brochures, I, I crafted all the language. So it wasn't just the visual, I made the language all the same. So you might have noticed your information, your evacuation information. I made all of that what we call direct conversation. So getting away from the more scientific, technical, authoritative tone and the more conversational, inviting that um, plain language, inviting that community member in. So we're trying to do that. Um, we, we're just starting, we're like two years old, this network, but that's what we want to do is in now reaching out to the community, but also reaching out to the EMs and being able to do this together.
It's a completely different change. So um, Klaus Kremer, he's on the design network for Emergency Manager. He does an app, and he lives in Wellington, New Zealand, so they have a big tsunami um, um, risk there. He developed an app that would actually pinpoint the uh, user and walk them out, like literally walk them. It'll show on the phone, walk them out to a safe zone, and it has a countdown also when the risk would hit them. Um, for Tsunami Clear, what my proposal for the software programming wasn't going to be individual maps. It would be type in your address, and it would work offline. See, this is why, this is great, right? If you're a computer science in here and coder, you're like, oh, you know, one of these people who don't, like, make that happen, you know? Work offline where someone can, or they can pin it before so it works offline. Um, it wouldn't be individual maps. It would be, the whole thing would just be coded where you could punch in where your address is, and it would pick you up, and you could zoom in that way. Um, that's what the, the, those grants were for. Yeah, and Stamen Design, who's the, the data visualization um, software engineering, they were going to handle that side of it. And they said it was possible. Yeah.